Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. What is the good news? It's that Jesus left his throne in heaven, was born a very humble birth in a manger, grew up and lived a perfect, sinless life. He was crucified on the cross for your sins and for my sins because we needed a savior. We are all sinners and we could not save ourselves. Nothing we do could ever get us into heaven, but Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, which is death. Um, he died a horrific, painful, bloody death on the cross for our sins. But the story doesn't end there. He, on the third day, he rose again from the grave, defeating death, defeating Satan. He ascended into heaven and he's coming back for us very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. Yes, he's coming back for us and we're going to be leaving this earth very soon. Um, the seven-year tribulation is coming and it's coming sooner than people think it is. But Jesus is going to call us out of the world before the wrath of God is poured out on an unbelieving, unrepentant world. So what must you do to be saved? It's really simple. You believe in Jesus. You believe in his finished work on the cross and you will be saved. You believe in his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. He's alive and he's coming soon. If you believe in him, you will be saved and nobody, nothing can take you away from Jesus. You are his and he is yours. Once you've been saved, you're always saved. Um, an easy way to look at it is the ABCs. You admit that you're a sinner because if you can't admit that you're a sinner, then why would you need a savior? You believe, and that is the key, belief. You believe in Jesus. And C is to call on him or confess your sins to him, which basically is more of confirmation for you. And it starts you out in prayer. Um, it starts you out with prayer and a relationship with God. Yes, I'm kind of looking at my bangs. Um, I just chopped them today. Um, and I always go shorter so that they take longer to grow out. But it's weird. Um, <laughs> still, I don't like having hair in my eyes. And if you see from my previous videos, my hair, it was growing out longer. So it'll take a while for it to do it again this time. Um, but today we are talking about not my vanity. Sorry. Um, we're talking about Adam and Eve and the fall of the fall of humanity. This world was perfect. God made it perfect. And it wasn't meant to be what it is today. What we see today is not what was meant. Um, but we were given free will. So let's get into this. And first, I want to read Genesis chapter 3. Because that's um, what we're going to be discussing so we're going to start with Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm just going to read this whole chapter. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You certainly, you will certainly, oh, I'm sorry, I gotta make sure I do this word for word because this is scripture, right? So you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, 
She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. I will make your... To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said... Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return." Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. It says it all right there, doesn't it? Um, sometimes it takes us a long time to recognize that we are in the wrong about something. Um, as the prophet Jeremiah writes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Even when we feel that we are doing the right thing with the best of intentions, our judgment can be self-deceived to the point that we struggle to recognize that we fail. <sighs> that we fail to recognize even the most... Um, horrible sins in us. The Apostle, the Apostle John underscores this idea, writing, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 8. But other times, we immediately know that we have done something wrong after committing a sin. In those moments, the question is not whether we have sinned, but rather how could we possibly have come to that point? Where did we get off course? How could we ever have been so deceived? What would justify acting with such arrogance and disregard? I know I've been there. Um, I believe that if you're honest with yourself, you have too. Satan's strategy for luring us into sin is fairly consistent. In one way or another, Satan attempts to drive a wedge between us and God, and he does this by driving a wedge between us and God's word. Satan first leads us to doubt whether God's word is good, and then whether God's word is true, and then finally whether God's word is even relevant. This is the strategy that Satan used to lure Adam and Eve into sin, 
and it is the strategy he still employs to this day. Our success in standing firm against Satan's schemes depends on our ability by the grace of God to recognize and oppose these schemes by pleading and trusting in the power of God's word. As we study the first temptation in Genesis 3, let us pray that God will give us grace to become more aware of the enemy's tactics in our own lives so that we can live lives characterized by increasing obedience to God. At the end of Genesis 2, it is difficult to see how anything could possibly lure Adam and Eve away from the bliss that they experienced in the Garden of Eden. The newlywed couple was the special object of God's affections, and they were given dominion and authority over all the rest of creation. They received all the food they could eat from the entire garden, with only one single tree held back. A noble mission to achieve, um, and a perfect marriage where the two were naked and unashamed. How then could God's image bearers possibly commit treason against their God? And Genesis 3 unfolds the tragic details. The first verse of Genesis 3 provides us with background information to help us understand the story that we just read. Namely, we read something about the serpent who will interact with Eve. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. Genesis 3.1. This background information sets up the story in several important ways. First, the narrative identifies this creature as a serpent. The ancient Israelites, the original audience in Genesis, already knew that God had classified the serpent as an unclean, detestable animal on the basis that it swarms on the ground going on its belly. Leviticus 11.42, and Genesis, you can cross-reference that with Genesis 3.14. Um, Genesis 3 perhaps explains the reason for the serpent's unclean classification. This is the animal that seduces Adam and Eve to rebel against their holy God. Second, despite the fact that this is a detestable, unclean animal, we read that this serpent is among every other beast of the field that the Lord God made. This means that God created this animal. So that the serpent is not some kind of dualistic god of evil who rivals God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, including the snake. This snake is rebelling against his creator. He is not an alternative deity, deity um, whom Adam and Eve might legitimately worship. Third, because the serpent is an animal, God has given Adam and Eve dominion and authority over the serpent. Genesis 1, 26 and 28. The serpent is not equal to Adam and Eve, and much less is he their superior to obey. Rather, Adam and Eve have charge over him as a servile creature who is not created in the image of God, like the man and his wife were. Furthermore, God charged Adam with the task of keeping the Garden of Eden clear of all uncleanliness and rebellion against the Creator, Genesis 2.15. So the failure of Adam and Eve is twofold. They subject themselves to an animal rather than exercising authority over it, and they fail to keep the garden free from a, rebe a rebellious creature. Instead, not only did they neglect to punish it, but in violation of all lawful order, they subjected and devoted themselves to it as participants in the same apostasy. And fourth, we're told that the serpent is crafty. A play on words with the term naked um, from the previous verse, Genesis 2.25, the wordplay ought to put us on, on the alert, instructing us that the serpent is speaking carefully, craftily and shrewdly, while the man and the woman are interacting with him in naked innocence. And indeed, the serpent will deceive Eve and prompt Adam to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without ever directly instructing them to do so. 
The serpent demonstrates his craftiness right away, asking the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The serpent begins then not with an assertion, and certainly not with outright instruction, but with merely a suggestion. This is disturbing and flattering. It, sm it smuggles in the assumption that God's word is subject to our judgment. The serpent craftily implies, without directly saying as much, that God's limitations are indeed too restrictive. This is a preposterous suggestion, since God has encouraged the man and the woman to eat of every tree in the entire Garden of Eden, except for only one. However, the framing of the question raises a doubt in the, woman, in the woman's mind that the serpent will eventually ex exploit. Still, if the question of the serpent is bad, the response of the woman's is far worse. First, the woman understates God's generosity, saying only, we may eat of the fruit, rather than quoting God's statement from Genesis 2.16, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. This is the first act of ingratitude. While the woman does admit that God has given the first couple fruit to eat, she fails to acknowledge the abundant generosity of God in commanding them that they may surely eat from every tree of the garden. In contrast, the woman's words make God's provision seem meager. Second, the woman exaggerates the strictness of God's law, adding an extra provision, neither shall you touch it. Even though God had said nothing to that effect, here we see the first example of legalism in the Bible. Rather than quoting the commandment ver ver verbatim, the woman adds an additional layer to the law beyond what God has spoken. It is unclear whether she has misremembered the law or whether, or whether Adam told her the law incorrectly or whether she is trying to set a higher bar for herself than God had asked of her. Regardless, uh, we can correctly analyze the effect of attempting to obey a degree of the law beyond what God has required. This addition continues to build up the idea in their minds that God's law is restrictive. Sadly, it is the woman who builds this idea up, not the serpent. And third, the woman relaxes the punishment for eating from the tree, stating, lest you die, Genesis 3.3, rather than what God had said, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, Genesis 2.17. This statement reflects the first failure to fear God. In these words, the woman reduces the death sentence that God has pronounced as the punishment for such an action into merely a hypothetical conditional possibility. The woman's words would be on the level of saying, be sure to buckle up your seatbelt on your way home lest you die. Failure to buckle your seatbelt does not carry an instantaneous sentence of death. Rather, death is a hypothetical possibility that could only happen in the unlikely event that you were in an accident. Eve seems aware of some vague, distant threat of something called death, but the fear of God's glorious, righteous justice does not hold power over her imagination. And fourth, most insidiously, the woman follows the lead of the serpent um, in referring to God as he is called throughout Genesis 24 through, or 2, 4 through 25, simply God. By using only the more impersonal title God and leaving off the personal name Yahweh, she unwittingly distances herself from her covenant Lord. This is the first time that human beings depersonalize Yahweh God. Here, the woman creates a character of Yahweh God rather than dealing with the blazing reality of the God whose name is I am what I am. Exodus 3.14. Eventually, this depersonalization will grow into more obscene forms, such as creating graven images to worship as though they were actually accurately depicted of Yahweh or God. Um, or questioning whether other gods like Baal or Asherah might be more powerful than Yahweh. First Kings 18.21. Uh, today, this 
de um, depersonalization of Yahweh God looks like the deism that professes belief in some kind of God, but that wants to define that God entirely on our own terms. Typically, the depersonalization includes the rejection of the triune nature of our one true God and the rejection of his laws that do not fit our own standards of morality. Even in Genesis 3, it is far easier to rebel against an impersonal genetic deity than to rebel against um, God who is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. The serpent leverages all of his craftiness towards one goal, undermining the word of God. This observation should demonstrate the importance of both knowing and believing God's word. Notice the damage inflicted because the woman lacked a perfect knowledge of God's word. The serpent exploits this imperfect knowledge not only through the framing of his initial question, but even more effectively in the woman's response to the serpent. Rather than responding to the serpent with pure word of God, she understates, exaggerates, and relaxes God's word all in one statement. We find a counterexample of the woman's poor handling of God's word when we come to the temptation of Jesus. There, Jesus meets the temptations of Satan head on by a perfect knowledge of the word of God, quoting three times from, from Deuteronomy to foil the plans of the tempter, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Even when Satan quotes the scriptures out of context to get Jesus to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple, Matthew 4, 6, Jesus recognizes what the serpent is doing and puts Satan's quotation from the Psalms into the larger context of the law. So Jesus responds to Satan's misuse of scripture by quoting a clear passage of scripture. Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Matthew 4, 7. Jesus' temptation um, story illustrates that we must not only memorize the text of scripture, even though understanding scripture necessarily begins with the knowledge of the text, um, with the text itself. Beyond that, we must also move on toward understanding the overarching theology of scripture, lest we be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Ephesians 4.14, 4, Satan did not know scripture better than the word, who became flesh, but Satan knows scripture better than you or I do. Let us therefore be on our guard against his deceitful th um, schemes. This story also illustrates the crucial importance of faith in the moment of temptation. Remember one of Satan's craftiest strategies in this temptation um, is to lead the woman to speak of God as merely God in order to undercut her trust in him. His desire was to get her to believe that God might not really care for her. A suggestion, a suggestion that he drives at from the very first question of surprise. Did, I'm sorry, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Once again, we find the counter example in the temptation of Jesus. In the last temptation, after Satan had appealed to Jesus' physical needs and to misquote scripture, Satan attempted to give Jesus the good gift that the Father had planned to give his Son all along, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. If only Jesus would bow down to Satan. Satan would give those kingdoms to Jesus without any need to go through the suffering on the cross, Matthew 4, 8-9. through 9. Here was a crisis of faith very similar to the allure that the serpent held out to the woman. Was the father really good if Jesus would have to suffer to gain those kingdoms? Why not simply follow Satan to gain them by a shortcut? Um, there was nothing wrong with Christ ruling all the kingdoms of the world. It was his destiny. The temptation involved bypassing appropriate process and timing, seizing them through devious means. Jesus, of course, isn't fooled for a moment. He banishes Satan 
quoting scripture once again, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. No matter how good a gift Satan might be holding out to him and no matter how attractive Satan's path to that good gift might be, Jesus proclaimed that only the Lord God was worthy of our worship and our faith. From our Lord's example, we recognize that the scriptures must not only be known and understood, but the scripture must also be, become the fuel of our faith. <sighs> but observe that men that revolted from God, when having forsaken his word, they lent their ears to the falsehoods of Satan. Hence we infer that God will be seen and adored in his word, and therefore that all reverence for him is shaken off when his word is despised. A doctrine most useful to be known, for the word of God obtains its due honor only with a few, so that they who rush onward with impunity in contempt of this word, yet arrogate, um, arrogate to themselves a chief rank among the worshipers of God. But as God does not manifest himself to men otherwise than through the word, so neither is his majesty maintained, nor does his worship remain secure among us any longer than while we obey his word. Therefore, unbelief was the root of defection, just as faith alone unites us to God. Seeing and adoring God in his world happens only through prolonged attention to the word of God in careful study and prayer. Prayer is essential for this since only the Spirit can open the eyes of our hearts to behold the beauty of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in God's Word. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through chapter 4 through 6. What disciplines do we have for remaining, oh my gosh, for remaining in the face of Jesus Christ in God's Word? 2 Corinthians Um. 3, 12 through 4 through 6. Um, yeah, read, the, read, read chapter 3 through chapter 4 um, in 2 Corinthians. Actually, read all of 2 Corinthians. It's an amazing book. Um, but what discipline do we have for remaining in the Word and prayer regularly? And more, um, do we engage in these disciplines out of drudgery or out of delight as we seek to cultivate our love for and faith in God? who speaks, us in, um, speaks to us in his word. After the serpent leads the woman to misquote and misunderstand God's word, the serpent seeks next to lead the woman to doubt the truthfulness of God's word altogether. Satan still uses this tactic to this day. So we would do well to analyze his crafty methods as he originally used them in the Garden of Eden. The serpent responds to the woman saying, you will not surely die, Genesis 3, 4. The serpent's words are interesting. Since he does not completely contradict God's word, in Hebrew, God literally says, you shall die, die, Genesis two seventeen. In Hebrew, authors sometimes repeat words to demonstrate emphasis, which is what is happening here. So in Genesis two seventeen, God repeated the word die, twice, for the sake of emphasizing the certainty of the death that would come if the man and woman ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For this reason, we usually translate the first word die as surely, you shall surely die. So the serpent does not contradict God's statement altogether. Instead, he only negates the first recurrence of the word die to lessen the certainty of the death. Certainly the woman could die, from eating this fruit, but her death is by no means certain. <laughs> um, in this way, the serpent's words follow the way the woman relaxed the certainty of God's punishment by saying, lest we die. The serpent is echoing and reinforcing the woman's idea that their death might not be so inevitable after all. The next statement creates the sense that According to the serpent, it was never really God's intention to put them to death. He only said that to discourage you from acquiring the marvelous properties of the tree. In effect, then, the serpent does not actually contradict God. He only suggests that there is nothing to worry about. The overall effect of the serpent's words up to this point, then, is to suggest that God is not good. 
since he has withheld something good, and that God's penalty is not certain, since the man and the woman will not surely die. This is a powerful blend of lies, since it provides the man and the woman with both motive and opportunity to rebel against the Creator. Still, the man and the woman do not necessarily have a compelling reason to eat the fruit. Why disturb with their good situation? Therefore, the serpent's next move is to give them a compelling reason to disobey. He explains not only why they may sin, but why they should sin, saying, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. How could the man and the woman resist an opportunity to become gloriously wise like the Creator? Furthermore, why would God, why would God be so sinister as to keep them from the fruit that would enable them to become like him? Suddenly, the temptation of the serpent advances from becoming a mere possibility to a moral obligation. Derek Kidner um, shrewdly recognizes the tragic long-term trajectory of such thinking. God will henceforth be regarded, consciously or not, as rival and enemy. The human race will approach God with pervasive suspicion in the realm of wisdom. In every generation, human beings created in the image of God will succumb to the lie that we are wiser than God in evaluating good and evil for ourselves. Even more, we will reject God's word as his attempt to keep us in ignorance and in poverty. Instead, we will, we will believe that we see the world with open eyes that gives us the ability to judge good and evil for ourselves as though we were God. This is monstrous, foolish pride, and yet it seems so natural, reasonable, and wise. Fundamentally, there are two problems with this outlook. First, while we can often get what we want at some level, we end up gaining far more than we bargain for. The man and his wife do not die, at least not until Adam reached the ripe age of 930 years, while verse 7's um, notes that their eyes were opened, and in verse uh, 22, God says, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. On first reading, at least, God seems to have tried to deceive his creatures by issuing threats he subsequently did not fulfill. The snake told the truth, not the Lord God. But the truth is, they were never meant to die, ever. They were created to live forever. And once you move beyond these surface-level observations um, of your first reading, it becomes apparent that the serpent is only speaking in half-truths. While Adam and Eve do not drop dead on the day of their rebellion, they are immediately separated from the direct presence of God in the garden. Separation from God is the essence of death, since we can only find true life in the presence of God. On this point, the Apostle John would later write, Whoever has the Son of, has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 1 John 5.12 Furthermore, while the eyes of the man and the woman are indeed opened, they only see misery. Losing their innocence and gaining shame over their nakedness, they receive the blessings they sought, but they discover that those blessings are cursed. Second, when we insist upon rebelling against God in order to gain some good thing that we believe he is holding back from us, we often miss out on gaining exactly that good thing. Although we are not told specifically in this passage, in all likelihood, God intended to introduce the man and the woman to the knowledge of good and evil at the proper time. If the tree is not prohibited um, because what it grants is bad, and if it's not prohibited because of divine repression, then one can logically conclude that the prohibition concerning um, concerned timing. So, for instance, there is nothing wrong with driving, but there is something wrong with a five-year-old driving. Or we might observe that sex is a wonderful creation of God, but there is an appropriate time for such an activity. The problem with Adam and Eve's impatience to gain the knowledge of good and evil is not that they desire a good gift that God does not intend to give them. Rather, they lose the possibility of gaining that gift in its highest, purest form, by waiting on God's timing. 
At last, we come to that fatal moment when humanity plunges headlong into the curse of sin. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that she, um, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, Genesis 3, 6. The description of this scene is brief, and the language is even more terse in Hebrew than in English. With the first sin recorded in only eight words, Hebrew scholars also noted that the language of this verse involves six doubled consonants that are difficult to pronounce quickly, forcing a merciless concentration on each word. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the serpent at no point instructs Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Certainly everything the serpent says is intended for that purpose, but the serpent is, the serpent is too crafty to reveal his goals so openly. In fact, getting Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit is only the serpent's secondary goal. The serpent's primary goal is simply to get the woman to exercise her, her own judgment about whether she should eat the fruit. If the woman stopped listening to and trusting in God's word in favor of her own judgment, then the original sin was sure to follow. So the woman begins to behave toward the tree in the way that God himself behaved towards his creation. Seven times in Genesis 1, we read some deriv derivation of, and God saw that it was good. In Genesis 1, 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. And the evaluation of the woman takes the same form. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, Genesis 3, 6, additionally, um, as we've already noticed, um, um, noted, um, the woman's judgment of the tree mirrors what we read about God's creation from all the other trees of the garden. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. These words were repeated here in Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delightful to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Finally, the two words translated by the ESV as delight and desired in Genesis 3, 6 come from the same root word that are used to translate covet in the Ten Commandments. This correlation helps us to evaluate the entirety of what is happening here. The fatal moment of the woman's sin is through her covetous attempt to be like God through her own judgment. This independent judgment imitates but opposes the judgment and law of the Lord. When the woman begins to exercise judgment independently from the word of God, she necessarily takes the final step towards sin. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This is where the language becomes especially terse and difficult to pronounce, so that one may not read the text out loud quickly or easily, even despite the short word count. The overall effect is to illustrate the, fragil um, the fragility of the original human innocence while also demonstrating the tragedy of the mistake. She took and ate. So simple the act, so hard its undoing. Um, God will taste poverty and death before take and eat become verbs of salvation. Suddenly we learn of the presence of Adam in the garden, for she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Apparently, Adam had been there this entire time, and the text has, in fact, hinted at his presence, since all the instances of you in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, are in plural forms. This is, our, um, <sighs> since God instructed Adam to keep the garden, um, the garden of Eden pure and free from rebellion, and Adam alone heard God's law, Eve was not yet created when God spoke to Adam in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, when it, um, while it is the woman, not the man, who deceived, who, who is deceived, it is the man, not the woman, who is held responsible for the plunging of the human race under the curse of sin. God gave Adam a unique role of leadership within the first couple, but he does nothing while one of the lowly beasts of the field Leaves his, um, leads his wife astray, then after she has eaten, he takes some of the fruit and eats it with her. 
immediately the man and woman and woman recognized that they have sinned. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, Genesis 3, 7. What the serpent promised them about having their eyes opened had come true, but with disastrous consequences. With open eyes, they see that they are in fact naked. They have forfeited their innocence so that they are keenly aware of their nakedness with grief-filled shame. Even the words for naked are spelled differently from Genesis 2.25, when they were naked and were not ashamed, to here in Genesis 3.7. Um, at both points, they were without clothes, now they are exposed. Instinctively, the two sew together some kind of covering, any kind of covering, using fig leaves to create a makeshift loincloth. Um, thus, we see humanity's first attempt to cover over shame. Um, which succeeds about as well as our own attempts to hide shame um, have worked ever since. The fig leaves they use cannot really cover them so that God will later create for them new clothing of animal skins to fully cover their shame. More importantly, this attempt will do nothing to stop God from recognizing instantly that his beloved people had rebelled against him. They will take yet another step to cover their shame by hiding among the trees of the garden. But God will find them out nevertheless. And um, by the way, those clothes that God made for them, he killed an animal. That was the first animal that was killed so that um, they could be clothed. The first uh, basically sacrifice for sin to cover their shame. Um, in a moment, all the goodness of God's creation is shattered. What was noble, glorious, and authoritative um, dominion for the man and his wife is reduced to shameful, exposed nakedness. This is the first major turning point of the story of human history in the Bible. Through the rest of the Bible, everything we read will address the fallout from this sin. Graciously, God does not abandon his creation, but he begins the work of redemption. That story of redemption, which comes to a climax during the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ will begin immediately before the close of Genesis 3. But while we read the beginning of the rest of the story in the second half of Genesis, let's just imagine the weight of the shameful, anxious uncer uncertainty that Adam and Eve must have experienced before hearing the promise of the first gospel in Genesis 3.15. Or before seeing the first sacrifice when God covers their shame by putting to death a substitute in their place to provide animal skins for their clothing in Genesis 3.21. Adam and Eve know nothing about Noah, Abraham, David, or Jesus Christ. In fact, they do not even know whether God will still permit them to be fruitful and multiply at all. This is a dark day. And before rushing too quickly into the glorious light of redemption, let us sit, if only for a moment, in the horror and terror of the fall. Humanity will not feel such a weight of despair again until a naked, bleeding man gasps his final words. During his execution on a Roman cross, it is finished. John 19, 30. And that is the truth. We are all sinners and we've inherited that sin. And yes, we are that bad. If you don't know Jesus, I implore you to find him and find him today because we're running out of time to warn you. The world is spiraling out of control. Jesus is coming back for the church very soon. The seven-year tribulation is coming. And I want to see you in heaven. 